Hello, everyone. So today we're going to talk about unit testing for data scientists. And as we just said, my name is Hannah. I'm from Chicago. I work at ShopRunner. ShopRunner is a Chicago-based company, e-commerce company. Um, we like to refer to ourselves as the Amazon Prime for everyone else. So we work with a network of partners, of retail partners, to whom we provide a bunch of kind of data-driven tools for to like help them better connect with their customers. And then we have a membership base that we provide sweet benefits like these, like free two-day shipping and free returns and deals across this really broad network of partners. Despite our name, we don't actually do any of the delivery or logistics. So we do, particularly on the data science team, we spend a ton of time digging into this really rich, really cross-network data set, which is a lot of fun. If you're interested in ShopRunner, I have a bunch of free membership cards. You should come see me after this talk. All right, so we're gonna talk about unit testing today. Everybody's super excited, right? Unit testing is so much fun. Um, I hope you're as excited as this cat. Um, I like cats, there are a lot of cats in this talk. Uh, and all of the, there's also gonna be a bunch of code examples. All of the code examples are in a GitHub repo that I will share at the end and the slides will also be in that repo later today. So testing has a whole bunch of jargon that if you're not in software engineering, you may not be super familiar with. These are some of the terms. Today, we are just going to worry about unit testing. So there's all other types of testing that we're gonna to put to the side and we're gonna talk about unit testing. So unit testing is testing a single piece of code in an isolated context. So we're not gonna worry about how everything place together, but we're gonna make sure that each piece is doing what we want it to be doing. Well-tested code has a bunch of benefits. It's really nice to work at a code base that has a lot of good unit tests. It makes you, it makes it super easy to find bugs, which is very nice, always better to find them earlier rather than later. It makes it much easier to iterate. You're not scared to make changes in a code base that has really good tests because if you break something, you're gonna know and you're gonna get to make conscious choices about what to do about that. It makes it much easier to debug things. If something goes wrong and you don't know what's happening, you have this nice suite of like isolated pieces that tells you where exactly something broke. And it pushes you to actually design better code. So if you're writing tests for something and it's really hard to isolate pieces and it doesn't all fit together, that's often a clue that your code is not structured as well as it could be. And if you write code with the knowledge in mind that you're going to be writing tests for it, you will write cleaner code. But basically, unit tests give you confidence that your code does what you think it does. My favorite and least favorite thing about computers is that they always do exactly what you tell them to. This is a great way to make sure that what you're telling them is what you think you're telling them. Cool, so these all seem pretty nice. So why doesn't everybody write a whole bunch of unit tests? We've just listed off a bunch of great benefits. But as data scientists, I bet many of you in the room have written a fair amount of code and not unit tested it. So why not? Learning to write good tests is definitely an investment. So it takes time to learn to do it well, and it takes time to actually do it. But if you're ever gonna have to maintain the packages that you write, which if you want them to be used anywhere, you're gonna have to maintain them, means that this invest investment is worthwhile and you will gain the benefits over time of having good test suites built out. Another kind of tricky part as data scientists is that data science work follows a lot of different patterns than pure software engineering does. So when I first started as a data scientist, I was coming out of academia and I had kind of vaguely heard of a lot of these terms before, but I'd never actually written a unit test. And I think that's pretty common. I think a lot of us come, data science is an awesome field in that it draws people from a really wide breadth of fields, many of them academic, and many of them not super well versed in this kind of software engineering core skills that the people who maintain your websites at companies and whatnot are. So as I started reaching out and trying to learn how to do this better, I kept 
coming up with, there's a super wide variety of resources. I kept coming up with well-written blog posts and example sets and all of this, but they were all tailored to a slightly different approach than all of the code that I was trying to write, and thus all of the code that I was trying to test. So I'm here today to talk about specifically like the patterns that data scientists work with a lot and how we can test them well. So in theory, we have workflows that look something like this. We read in a bunch of data, we build a bunch of features, we build a bunch of models, we hand results off to someone, we evaluate the results, do some stuff at the end. Looks pretty straightforward. But in practice, particularly as you move towards kind of production systems, you get things that look more like this. This is, for example, what a lot of our workflows look like at JetRunner, where you have a bunch of pieces interplaying, you're reading data in, you're writing it out, you're calling APIs, you've got non-deterministic non things in there. This quickly gets overwhelming. <laughs> and this makes you just not want to write tests at all. But that is a bad idea and you will regret it later. So where do we start? So when you're gonna start writing unit tests, whether you're working with a code base that is mature and in existence but has never been unit tested, or you're starting to write a new package from scratch, you wanna start really small. You wanna start with a particular specific functionality that you wanna verify is actually happening the way you think it is. You wanna use all of the available tools, many of which we're going to talk about in a moment, to get everything else out of the way. Unit testing is all about isolation. It's all about taking this one defined functionality and ignoring everything else and saying, is this piece working the way I think it is? And then you do that for all of your pieces eventually, and you get a, gain a lot of confidence in what's happening overall. If you have an existing code base, don't try to write tests for it all at once. You will get overwhelmed, it will be frustrating, and you will give up. And that's really unfortunate. You really need to start small. You say, okay, we on the data science team at ShopRunner, we have only had a data science team for a couple of years, so we've worked mostly with new libraries that we've written, but we have other teams at ShopRunner who work with really extensive legacy code bases that no one entirely understands anymore. And in those cases, they're kind of slowly working to build test coverage by writing tests on the pieces as you work with them. So if I need to add something to this little piece of the code base, I'm gonna add tests for that little piece of the code base as I work on it, instead of sitting down and trying to test this enormous monolith that I don't really understand. And then this is a super vague guideline, and I'm upfront about that, but write tests as early as you feel like they are valuable. So in a data science workflow, oftentimes we start out in notebooks, we do some exploratory work, we play around with stuff, it's not super fixed, Writing unit tests at that stage is not really useful. But you don't want to sit down with a system that is about to be deployed to some production infrastructure and say, oh, but I need to write tests. Because at that point, it's still useful for the future, but you missed out on a lot of benefits along the way. So a good rule of thumb that we use, your mileage may vary, is to kind of, as you start pulling things into functions and pulling things into classes and organizing your code into libraries, it's a really good time to start writing unit tests too. Okay, so now we have kind of the idea of unit tests. How do we actually write them? So PyTest is one testing framework for Python. There are many, many of them are good. I like PyTest because it's both highly configurable, it's super flexible, and there's very little boilerplate, so it's also super simple to get started with. And this is like, it does the balance of those two really nicely. My team will also tell you that I get really excited when I get these like green lines to appear on my screen. Um, if you write a bunch of tests, you will learn that too. <laughs> uh, this is a bit of a side note, but if you are using PyTest, these are super helpful flags for PyTest that help you get a lot more useful information out of the test runner. So this is more for reference if you're interested, but super helpful. 
So now we know something about unit tests. We have a framework. Let's write some code. So we have this super useful function that adds a column to a pandas data frame. All of my functions that I'm testing in this talk are not functions I would actually advocate that you write because they are extraordinarily simple, but they kind of show, they're just gonna give us a thing that we can test to mimic some of the patterns that you see in data science work. So we have this add column function, we have a data frame, we have a column name, we have a default value for this column name, and then we're gonna make a new column and assign it that value. Cool. Now this is our first unit test. So this is an example of a PyTest unit test. It's just a Python function. We're gonna give our function a name. It's gonna start with test underscore, which is gonna let PyTest find our tests. So PyTest does really sweet test discovery like a lot of the testing frameworks do, where if you name your tests in a consistent manner, when you just run PyTest, it'll go and find them all for you and run them all for you. We're then going to define the input to the function that we wanna test. So in this case, we're setting up a data frame. We're gonna call the function that we want to test. We're going to set the expected value that we think we should get out of this function. And then we're gonna check that the value that we got was the value that we expected. Super simple. This pattern, this kind of setup, calling the function, setting what you expect to happen, and then asserting that what you expected to happen actually happened, is basically the pattern that all of your unit tests are going to follow. They're gonna get more complicated, but the same structure is a good way to think about the pattern. Okay, so we tested our super simple function. We know that it works, that's awesome. Let's now make our tests a little simpler and give us some tools to expand to test a bunch more things. We're gonna talk about fixtures. So fixtures are a special type of function that PyTest keeps track of in order to let you safely share resources and definitions of resources across tests. This may sound a little vague, we're gonna give some examples in a moment. If you've used other testing frameworks before, they're basically a really modular way to do setup and teardown methods. So this is defining a couple of new fixtures. You will recognize these data frames that we just defined in the test before. We have a data frame called df. Sorry, we have a function called df, which returns a data frame. And we have a function called df with column d that returns another data frame that has a column d. So we have this normal Python function that returns a value. It can do whatever kind of stuff you want a Python function to do. Sorry, and then we have a decorator that tells PyTest that this is indeed a fixture. There are a couple of ways that you can get PyTest to find your fixtures. Um, if you define fixtures in the same file as your tests, it will just find them, that's fine. As you get larger and larger test suites, that gets more and more complicated. And as usual, you want to start separating stuff out into different files. We often have a fixtures file or folder, depending on how large a library we're talking about. And then you have this conftest.py file, which is part of PyTest setup, that you import all of your fixtures into. And then PyTest knows that these, all these fixtures exist, and we can do cool stuff with them now. So now we're gonna write a test using these fixtures. You will notice that this test is very similar to the test that we did a few moments ago except it now looks way simpler. So we have these two arguments to our test now. You will notice that these, the names of these arguments match the names of the functions on the other side. This is not by accident and this is important because PyTest says, okay, I have this argument to this test. I'm gonna go and look at all of my fixtures. I'm gonna see if I have a fixture with that name. If I do, in this case we do, we found this df fixture. We're gonna run this function, execute any code in it, and we're gonna return the value that this function returns and funnel it into this variable that is an argument to the function. So when you call, when you call this test case on the right, 
you get an argument that's, a da that's called df that contains this data frame with columns a, b, and c. Similarly, the same thing happens with df with call d, and this data frame gets passed into the function as well. And so all of our setup work in this test has now been pulled out into these fixtures, and all we need to do is call the function and make assertions that we care about. This is super useful in that it lets you use the same data setup across multiple tests. If you were to try to do this with just like global variables or something, you run into all sorts of complications where you try to edit something and you change it and now your next test gets a different value and you can either break things or think that things are working when they're not super easily that way. So fixtures are a super nice, safe way to handle all of that without having to worry about those dependencies. <coughs> there are also built-in fixtures that PyTest comes with. Then some of these are kind of esoteric things that you're not likely to use that much, and, but some of them are really useful. Capsis is one that I use a fair amount. It is a fixture that exists that captures everything written to standard out or standard error during the execution of your test. And if you give capsis as a variable to your function, remember PyTest will look at that variable, say, okay, this variable is called capsis, I'm gonna go look for a capsis fixture, oh hey, I have one, so I'm going to capture everything that is sent to standard out or standard error, and I'm gonna return it in this variable, or this object. And then you can do this readout error function. So in this test example, function one is literally just a function that prints out inside function one. And here we can assert that that is in fact what is happening. This is often helpful if you have kind of modeling jobs that print out debugging stuff in them, like print out information about what's happening. This is a good way to verify that you're printing out the things that you think you are which may not feel, feel super critical to the functionality of what's happening, but is super critical to understanding <laughs> the, that the things that you are using to debug your code are actually real. Another useful side note, you can run pytest dash dash fixtures will list out all of the available fixtures. So this includes the fixtures that pytest defines itself, as well as any that you have defined in your own code with their doc strings. So just a nice way to check that everything's being pulled together the way you think it is. Cool, so we've defined some fixtures, but we've defined super simple ones. Fixtures in and of themselves are actually really flexible. You can do all kinds of stuff with them. The kind of most basic thing to do is to just return a value, like we did with the data frames a couple slides ago but they can actually do way more stuff than that. So you can define the scope of a fixture. So this means that the, your fixture function might be run, by default is run at the start of every test, but you can also define it so it's only run at the start of every session or every class or a different, bunch of different levels. You can compose fixtures. You can have fixtures that depend on other fixtures. You can execute custom teardown code when the fixture leaves the scope. So you can have a fixture that needs to be torn down at the end of a test and have that all happen automatically. So this is the teardown side of the setup and teardown methods. You can also access the kind of text context when you're in the fixture. Basically, this is a way to let you pass parameters from a test to fixtures. And then you can actually parameterize the fixtures to depend on different variables. It may not be obvious why you want to do many of these things, but there are cases where they're useful. This is one case where they're useful. We write a lot of PySpark code at ShopRunner. So we then want to write tests for this code, but we want to run the tests on a single machine. We don't want to spin up a Spark cluster to run our tests. So you can define a local Spark session, which is what we're doing right here. And this is also then showing several of the flexibility features that I just mentioned. So we're defining the scope. The scope of this fixture is the session 
So that means when you run PyTest, everything that happens after that is one test session. So what this does is it's going to create a Spark session, and then it's going to run all of my tests in it, and then it's going to tear down the Spark session. This is useful because it takes a while to spin up a Spark session. <laughs> so you don't really want to do it before and after every single one of your tests, because then you spend most of your time creating and destroying Spark sessions, and very little of your time actually testing your code. So I talked about accessing the test context. That's what this request argument is. So the request argument sends a bunch of information about what's happening in the test case to the fixture. And then the fixture can access it like it's happening here with this request.add finalizer, which is one way, there are a couple, to add custom teardown code. So this says that when I exit this scope, so in this case, my scope is a session, so when I'm done with the testing session, I'm going to call spark.stop. And that stops the Spark session so I don't just, you know, have a Spark session running internally on my computer. So this is one example of like a thing that we want to do a lot that is really easy in this, in this setup because of the flexibility of these fixtures. One other thing I mentioned is dependencies. So if we're testing Spark code, we're going to want fixtures that, instead of being pandas data frames, are Spark data frames. So, but in order to create a Spark data frame, I need a Spark session. So this is a, another fixture that take, depends on the first fixture. So it takes the Spark session defined in the first fixture, and it uses it to create a data frame that it then returns. So then I can reference this Spark DF fixture in my tests and be good to go. So fixtures do a whole bunch of things. If you need to set something up and you're not sure how to do it, definitely go look at fixture docs because they do all sorts of crazy things that I had no idea they would do when I got started. Another super useful tool that you may have heard of is mocking. So mocking is like a general idea that's used in all sorts of kind of programming languages. Um, but it's also the name of the library in Python that does mocking for Python. Um, so uh, some Python specific and some not there. So we're going to talk about, we're going give to give an example here to think about why we might want to mock things. So I bet everybody in this room has read from a database in Python code before. It's a thing that we do all the time because our data often lives in databases. And we might have a function that looks like this. So I wrote a super general generate features function. Take some credentials, do some stuff. Then I'm going to create a SQL alchemy engine and pass it to read pandas read SQL function. If you're not familiar with the setup, it's basically just a way to connect to a database and execute a SQL query and get a data frame back. And then I'm going to do some processing on that data frame, generate some features, return this features function. So this is one snippet in a larger function, and I want to be able to test this function. I want to know that my feature generation code is doing the right things. But when I'm running my tests, I don't want to actually access the database. Maybe I'm running them in a different setup where I can't actually connect to the database. Maybe I just don't want to touch production servers from my laptop because that's scary. All sorts of things. So we want to be able to get rid of this, to just like tuck out, out of the way this database access. So we want to replace this connection with like a, a fake thing that looks like a connection but doesn't actually connect to anything. And then we want to be able to return some data from this read SQL function. Because if we don't actually return anything, then the rest of the code is going to fail. And we don't want that. We want to know what happens in the rest of the code. But we want to just kind of short circuit this somehow. So this is what mock lets you do. So this is a test using mock. There are a couple of pieces here that are doing some interesting things. So you will notice these mock.patch decorators on this function. Patch is a method of mock, of like a function in mock, that does this short circuiting part. So it's, it goes and finds the place in the code where you're using this function that you don't want to actually use. 
and it sticks something else in there instead. And then there are mock objects as well that usually is the thing you stick in. And we're going to talk a little bit more about mock objects in a moment. But this mock.patch essentially goes and grabs this create engine function and this read SQL function, sticks this mock object in its place, and then I can call my generate features function. And as it runs through it, instead of actually accessing the database, it's going to make those same calls to these mock objects instead, which aren't going to do anything, except what I tell them to. So I have said here, I have this read SQL mock. We're going to talk more about the logistics of how all of this gets passed through in a moment, so don't worry too much about the details. But I'm setting a return value here as a data frame. So this means that when I call this mock, which is going to happen because it got patched into place, instead of not having anything to return because it didn't actually talk to the database, I've given it this data frame to return. So now I can run my test, and it can, my test can run generate features, and now it has a data frame to play with, and I can make sure that the actual features that my generate features function return are the features that I would expect given DF as the input data frame, as like the input data. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about the specific mock objects. We have this really awesome mock stuffed animal over there. Um, <laughs> And so a mock object is a funky thing. It's just a, a fake object that you can stick in a spot that does basically two things. And that's let you get rid. And the, and the point of those things is just to let you cut out dependencies. So we talked about unit testing being testing things in isolation. And this is a really powerful tool to isolate things in complicated systems. So things you might want to mock, as we just talked about, database reads and writes. You probably don't want to actually do that during testing, so you can mock them away. API calls, you probably don't want to actually call the APIs, so you can mock them away. And then just in general, external functions that you don't care about testing, that aren't part of this one specific piece of functionality that you are currently trying to test. So often you will have a system where you will mock part of it away, while you're testing this piece. And then in the next test, you're going to test this piece and mock the first piece away. So it doesn't mean that you're never going to test this piece of code. But it's not relevant to the current thing that we're trying to understand. So unit test.mock is Python's unit testing library. It's part of standard lib in Python 3. If, it's, if you're using Python 2, don't. But also, you can import mock as a library from, from PyPy. It's backported to Python 2 as well. Um, OK. So Python's mock library has a variety of mock objects in it. But almost always, what you want is the default magic mock object. And these objects behave in interesting ways. You can alter their behavior in a bunch of ways. But by default, they accept any call that's made to them, any attribute access, any method access. They don't throw any errors, no matter what kind of call you make on them. And every time you make any sort of call, the return value of that call is a new magic mock object. And similarly, any time you access an attribute of a magic mock object, what you get, that attribute is created as a new magic mock object. And then all of these magic mock objects record everything that happens to them. So each magic mock object records any call that's made to it and the arguments of that call. So they're really useful for assertions then. So this is just me playing around in a REPL with magic mock objects. If you're not familiar with these objects, if you haven't used them a lot, I highly recommend this exercise of just trying a bunch of things, seeing what gives you errors, seeing what return values are. It's super useful to just get a sense for what happens, because it's not very intuitive. <laughs> They're very strange objects. 
So the details of what I'm doing here are less important than just kind of this idea that it's really useful to play around with a little bit. So I talked about mock objects doing kind of two things. One of the things that mock objects do is they like provide actions. They have, they return stuff when you call them. As we just said, by default, they return new magic mock objects, but that's not always what you want, right? And like in the database read function that we just talked about, we wanted to actually return a data frame because we wanted to know what would happen to that data frame in the rest of the function. So there's a couple of ways to get your mock to give stuff back. The first way is a method called return value. This one's pretty straightforward. You give it, you set a return value, and then every time you call that mock, you get that return value back. So if I set my return value to be a list of three integers, every time I call that mock, I get back a list of three integers. Then the other way to get things back is this side effect method. This side effect method is very unintuitive to me, but it's super useful and you're gonna use it a lot. There are kind of three main ways to use it. The first one is the most common. So let's say I have a function that gets called several times in the function that I'm testing <coughs> and I wanna mock it. But I, want a, I need a different return value every time I call it. You do that with side effects. So you can set side effect equal to any kind of iterable. And then each time you call the function, you get back to the next thing in your iterable. So the first time I called this mock object, I would get back first object. The second time I called that mock object, I would get back second object, and so on. Um, another thing you can do is set the side effect to be an exception. And then any time you call this function, you will get, you, it will throw that exception, it will raise that exception. This can be useful for testing error handling paths in your code. Um, I don't use it all that often, but that's, that's one thing it's useful for. Then this next one, so these are all side effects, is the method for all of these. It does a couple different things. The last thing it does is you can set it to be another function. If you set your side effect method to be a function, then every time this mock object is called, the side effect function is also called with the same arguments given to the call to the mock object. And then if, it, if that throws an error, it throws an error. If it doesn't, it returns the return value. So here I have a lambda function that checks if, that takes one variable and checks if that variable is even or odd. And this is just some modular math if you're not familiar. And just returns the string odd or even, depending on whether the int given was, is odd or even. So now, after setting the side effect, if I call this mock object with one argument that's the integer one, I'll get back a string that says this is odd. If I call it with the integer 20, I'll get back a string that says even. If I call it with three integers, I'm gonna get an error because that doesn't match this, the signature of the side effect method. This is a, the functions are easy to do weird things with. Um, I have only ever used them to do very hacky things that I would not really recommend, um, but they can be useful in certain cases. Okay, so this is a bunch of actions that your mock can take, the so things that your mock can do in a test function. The other thing that we care about is the assertions that we can make on the mock object when we're done with the test. So you mock some stuff, you patch it into your, the functions that you're trying to test, you run your function that you want to test, and then you have these mock objects that have recorded everything that's happened to them in the test. And so sometimes you care whether or not something happened to them. So a good example here is if you're mocking a write to a database, you might well want to mock, so you do want to mock that write, and then you will want to assert that you wrote the thing you intended to write. So you want to check that whatever your write database function is got called with the data frame that you were intending to write to that database. So there's all kinds of assertion methods. This is a small subset of them. Um, so you can assert that a mock was called at all. You can assert that it was called exactly once. You can assert that it was called with certain arguments. You will also sometimes get into cases where 
the precise thing that you want to assert is not one of these methods. And in that case, this call args list method is super useful because it gives you back a list of all of the calls made to that object. And then you can do whatever parsing on them, whatever checking you want to do. So it's a little less clean, but a lot more flexible. Uh, one warning. Uh, be, warning of, be wary of typos here. Um, remember that mocks accept any call made to them with very few exceptions. So this first case, assert called once is a real mock method assertion that will check if that mock was called once. And if it was, then it passes. If it's not, it throws an exception. This next one, maybe I forgot exactly what this interface was, what this API was. And I called mock.called once. This is not a method that exists in mock's library, but it's not gonna throw an exception <laughs> because mocks accept all calls made to them. <laughs> so you will instead get back a magic mock object and it will continue on its way, which means your test will never fail, which means you think you're testing something, but you're actually not testing anything at all. So that's a good thing to be, be wary of. They have, um, in, in recent releases of mock, made some concessions to this. And they've made it so that any method starting with assert, if it's not actually an assertion, will throw an error. So if you're bad at typing like I am and you uh, call a method assert called but you spell it wrong, then that will throw an error. So they've started to help it out a little bit, but it's still something to be wary of. Mocks also have some like particular gotchas. Um, one is where to patch an object. So when you call mock.patch, you give it a string that's a path of Python, essentially Python imports, but it's not what you think it's going to be if you're not used to this framework and if you don't think super carefully about how Python imports work. Um, so if I want to mock a panda, a, like pandas.read CSV call in my function, I might think that the second way is the way to do that. I want to mock pandas read CSV, so I'm going to call mock on this string pandas.read CSV. That's not going to work. Um, instead, you have to mock the object where it's used, not where it's defined. So in this first case, in the, with the green check mark here, I have a module called PyTest examples, a file called functions to test. In functions to test, I import pandas as pd. And then somewhere in that file, I say pd.readcsv. So at the point in time where mock can stick my mock object in where it's supposed to be, um, pandas can replace these objects. I'm sorry, I am over time. I apologize. Um, the other mock is import, the other gotcha is import order. You can pay attention to these things in a future moment. Um, these, it's a, it's a good thing to check out. The, the order of your mocks is opposite of what you think it should be when you patch things. So these last are just a couple of resources. These are a couple of useful libraries you should check out. And then these are some useful blog posts to read. This bit.ly link contains a further and a more extensive list. And this is a link to the repo that has all of these examples. And we'll also have these slides later on. Apologies for running over. If you have any questions, talk to me later.